Chapter 23 The Academy of Leipzig In London, at Chester Place, Ignaz paced about the dining room. Charlotte sat at the table, running her fingers through her hair. There was a moment of silence until Charlotte couldn't stand it any longer. So you want her family to move to Leipzig? Felix is to start an academy there, and suggested that I be head. I know we thought about Berlin, but Felix informed me of the king's failure to make a school there. I'll have a better chance at getting work in Leipzig. Are you sure we can afford it? What of Chester Place? It's been such a good home. Charlotte sighed somberly. Ignaz gave a disheartened tone. I will miss it dearly, but the London we know is changing. I'm struggling to keep up, and I think Germany will give me more opportunity. I'll ask Felix about the living costs. As you know, he's quite a good house agent. You're lucky you came across that boy those years ago, Charlotte stated. Ignaz chuckled. That I am. Back in Leipzig, Felix was penning a wistful sketch of flutes on a scratch piece of paper. The ideas flowed as he wasn't at the writing desk in the parlor. Instead, he had acquired his own workspace by moving the children to another room and transforming the nursery into an office. It became his sanctuary of comfort and privacy. The room contained a sturdy desk with shelving, making it perfect for storing scores in progress. The mantel of the desk and the wall above were decorated with watercolor landscapes, as well as portraits of family. A nice one of Fanny was set out. On the other wall, a large oak cabinet with paneled glass doors stood. Felix had favorable decor on top of it, including a bust of Johann Sebastian Bach. Opposite to the room's door, a window looked out into the sunset, over the meadows and fields. Near the window was a conducting desk, and to complete the room, a quaint little clavier, perfect for composition and practice. Felix enjoyed every bit of his man cave. Felix continued penning outlines of music for the Shakespeare play. He wanted to keep his word on the king's commissions, so he disciplined himself to be sure it was ready in due time. Yet the days were hindered with distraction. His luggage from Berlin had not been received, so he was without his books and scores. He used scratch paper for the time being. When bags began returning, he was too busy unpacking to chip away at composing. If he found time, he often sat, only to realize he had nothing but writer's block with the king's requests. In an attempt to get his brain going, he managed to complete a sonata for piano and cello. During his composition time, there was a light knock at the door and Cecil came, bringing in a few letters. She left them beside Felix as he was submerged in his work. While she left, she casually mentioned, I'm pregnant again. Felix set his pen down and looked to her, smiling. It made him chuckle inside over the fact that out of his siblings, he ended up with the most children. Felix then grabbed the letters to read. One was from Ignaz and the other from Paul. He opened Ignaz's first. They had been writing back and forth concerning Ignaz's plan to move his family from England to Germany. Felix had the utmost excitement that he considered Leipzig. It would be a dream come true for the two musicians to be united in the same city. Felix enticed Ignaz further, as he planned to start an academy of art in Leipzig. A few events led Felix to arrange such an idea. The King of Saxony had heard of the struggles in Berlin with King Frederick. When Felix made his leave of Berlin, it wasn't long before Felix received an offer from the King of Saxony. To be respectful, Felix made a trip to Dresden to thank the King verbally, but declined any positions. Before returning home, the King showed him something of interest. It was the will of an old man that passed, containing twenty thalers to establish an academy of art in Leipzig. Felix accepted to see it done by the next winter. Giving a full year, he felt that he would have a clean conscience knowing there was a successful academy in Leipzig. Almost as soon as putting the plans underway, in which Felix made sure got organized accordingly, the King of Prussia heard of it. He wasn't fond of the idea, but instead of scolding Felix, he tried to make the plans in Berlin sound more hopeful. Felix received notice after notice of King Frederick entitling him honors such as general music director and so forth. Felix wasn't fond of each polished title, as he didn't know how to live up to the old ones. After taking care of business with Ignaz's letters, he turned to the carefully folded note from his brother Paul. Felix felt nervous opening it, as there was a high chance he was begging him back to Berlin. After pausing a second, 
Felix gave a sigh and just opened it. In the parlor, Cecil was sipping hot cocoa while watching little Carl play with toys. He looked so cute with the setup of small wood animals, using his imagination. As the boy continued to play, Cecil suddenly heard a deep, somber whimpering. She set her cup of cocoa down to go check it out. It was coming from Felix's office. She cracked open the door. Honey. At the desk, Felix sat, staring in fear at the open letter before him. Tears were seeping from his eyes like never-ending rivers. The most melancholy sounds were being produced by his voice. Felix, honey. Cecil went to him. What is the matter? My mutter. Felix couldn't bring himself to form words. Cecil glanced at Paul's note dated the 12th of December, 1842. The message was simple. Leia had died. Come to bed for now. Cecil nudged him to get up. Felix stayed seated, grabbing blank paper. He began penning to Paul. Cecil took the pen from him. You do not need to write right now. Come to bed. Felix stood, sniffling much. His state caused him to be in a fog, so Cecil escorted him to bed. As soon as his head hit the pillow, he slept his sorrows away. Cecil felt the need to make him as cozy as possible, so she added extra pillows and blankets, making him snug. She then grabbed lavender oil and put some on his nose in hopes it would keep him calm. It was uncertain if he would wake in an emotional or irritable state so she did all she could to avoid the latter. After he looked to the standards, a spa would deem relaxed. Cecil made sure the room was dark and quiet. His morning session would last a few days, so she decided to sleep elsewhere. The whole of the next fortnight consisted of deciding what was to be done with the old beloved Berlin estate of Leipzigerstrasse No. 3. Paul owned it, but had no use for the main house, as he resided in the bank house. Fanny and Wilhelm still lived in the guest house. Rebecca and her husband resided elsewhere. In letters, Paul began offering the estate to Felix and his family as he didn't want to see the grand home Abraham had purchased go to waste. Felix felt that it needed to be decided further with his other siblings. He didn't want to move his family and get entangled in Berlin. In the moment, it was all too much as Felix couldn't gather every thought. The point of his family's union was now gone. He and his siblings were children no longer. The next visit with them would be enough of a trial. In the means of music, Felix couldn't fathom a note. He rather used his time to be thankful for his wife and children. They regularly bonded together with activities. The children, of course, loved it, as their father took the utmost pleasure in teaching them how to sketch windmills. Eventually, Felix's old love of music returned. He began writing again, but felt most comfortable if his children were playing nearby. Concerning people outside the home, Felix felt horrid around them. Herr Sleinich paid a visit, assuring him not to rush back to work. To start into a routine, Felix took up transcribing, instrumentation, and other half-mechanical tasks at home. The automatic work helped occupy his emotional void. It was hardly a week later at the Gavant house that I felt a melancholy air pass through the musicians as our beloved director returned. We expected Felix to be in utter quietness, but rather he came in his usual way, ready to take care of business. Herr Sleinitz had warned him that the first day back would be the hardest, but there was a fact to the matter. Sooner or later, the terrible day would have to come and go. The chorus had joined the orchestra for the day. Felix directed with much grace, letting the music calm his aching heart. After running a few pieces, an alto came forward to sing Weher Hirschisch Schreit. It was then Felix's inner feelings showed, becoming overcome. He tried to hold in his state with an occasional sigh, but everyone knew it to be the cry of longing. With each bar, the harder it was for Felix to keep composure, he seemed to be stressing himself as to not let a whimper leave his mouth. I knew that he needed to be excused, so I gestured the orchestra to a halt. When I looked back to the conducting desk, Felix was already exiting the nearest door. I set my violin down to go check on him. In the hall, I found him sitting on the ground against the wall. His eyes were dewed from giving free vent to tears. As soon as noticing me, 
His state of emotion reverted from the deep mourn. He forced a smile. Herr David, sorry, I am out of sorts. Nine, it is fine. I came to check on you. Danka, I think the worst of it is finished. He wiped a tear. I patted his shoulder. He then mentioned, I mean to have you and Schumann over to my place to discuss academy plans. Tomorrow I need a day alone, but the next I'm free. That works for me, I assured. His face began to show signs of holding tears, so I told him, It is all right to cry. It's not healthy to hold in hard emotions. I gave a friendly embrace as tears poured from his eyes in the middle of my comfort. His cries spilled all over my shoulder. Once he calmed, we returned to rehearsals. All right, it is January, and the new year of 1843, Felix stated happily. The plans for the academy are making rapid progress. I shall accept to be one of the first teachers, I nodded. Herr Schumann added, I'll take care of the announcements in the papers. He penned notes. The three of us were at the dining table in Felix's home, discussing the Leipzig Academy. Excellent, Felix wrote on a few note cards. First starts, I shall give public presentations at the Gouvant House to show what will be taught. When things get going, I'd like to make it a requirement of each member of the orchestra to contribute in some way to the school. Most will teach their specific instrument. Sounds fair, I agreed. Felix finished his note cards. I have my first presentation ready, so I am going to head to the concert house. I'll go with. I grabbed my coat to follow. Schumann trailed behind, but went separate ways to the printing shop to take care of the advertising. At the Gavant house, I joined the crowd gathered in the small hall, who wanted a taste of what teachings the upcoming school had to offer. Many young listeners were in hopes to be future students. Felix came before the interested spectators with his presentation. Now today I shall be speaking publicly about what will be taught concerning music theory classes. To give an example, I shall explain six four chords. Felix walked up to a blackboard with staff lines set up behind him. He explained firstly, To make this easier, I will write the example using the key of C major. No sharps or flats. The chords I will write will be a G major chord in the key of C. So a major dominant chord. He drew the notes G, H, and D on the bass clef in their proper spaces. To show that it was the major dominant chord, he put a capital Roman numeral 5 under it. So a G major chord is the dominant because the note G is a fifth from C, five spaces above C. Felix tried to be thorough in teaching, knowing some knew nothing of music. Now this chord is stacked as a triad, in root position, meaning the lowest note in this case is G. He glanced at his audience to be sure they followed. Most everyone nodded. The next chord I will write is also a G major chord. He wrote on the board. This time, next to the Roman numeral, he placed a 6-3. As you can see, I wrote using the same notes, but placed them in different positions. This is still a G major chord because when organized into a stacked triad, G is the lowest. This new way I wrote it, H is the lowest. This is what is called inverting chords. The numbers beside the 5 symbol indicate that it's the first inversion. H is the lowest, so six intervals above that is G, and three gives D. When reorganized into a triad, it shows that it's originally a G major chord. This now brings me to discuss six four chords. Felix chalked a third chord on the staff, writing next to the Roman numeral A64. Just like the other two chords, this is a G major chord, but this time in second inversion. The lowest note in this case is D. The numbers meaning that six intervals above D gives H, and four above gives G. Reorganized, it makes a G major triad. To find out how to tell what sort of chord you are looking at, you must know the key of the music. That is the starting point to tell if the chord is tonic, supertonic, mediant, subdominant, dominant, submediant, or a leading tone, or subtonic. To tell if it's inverted, it can be stacked into triads to show the original chord. The chords I described more commonly look like this. Inverting chords gives more options and variety for choral and counterpoint rules. The numbers are known as figured bass, in which can help a musician, particularly keyboardists, to fill in the chords freely with the indications given. In the time of J.S. Bach, it was common for a harpsichordist to accompany the orchestra, using figured bass to create an accompaniment. Felix closed his lecture. 
A few aspiring students asked him an array of questions afterwards. After tending to questions, the members of the orchestra gathered in the auditorium for regular rehearsals. There were many preparations within the Gavant House concerning concerts. Felix happened upon a new symphony written by a man from Denmark. His name was A. W. Gade, only 26 years of age and a professor of music in Copenhagen. Though Felix had a hard time searching for new favorable works, he concluded one thing was for sure. Though Scandinavians knew how to make music. After rehearsing Gade's symphony, Felix went to a writing desk and penned a letter, inviting Gade to come to Leipzig in the near future. After giving the note to a postman, Felix headed back home before the noon hour. When opening the apartment door, he found his family seated at the dining table as Johann served lunch. Upon seeing Felix, young Karl left his seat and ran to his father. Papa, Papa, piano, piano. After lunch, Felix guided him back to the table. Karl had lately been eager to learn piano as Ignaz had sent a present of music, the harmonized scales. It was a set of fifty-nine pieces for a juvenile performer and teacher. As the student played the scales in various tempos and rhythms, the teacher gave a full accompaniment. Karl was proud of his gift, but in reality Felix got the most enjoyment out of it. Usually he took time after breakfast to teach Karl his notes. They worked on other things as well besides music, such as writing letters. Karl had crooked handwriting, but he was still quite young. Felix loved every moment of helping him. After lunch had commenced, Karl rushed to the keys. Felix followed close behind and tested Karl on his notes. Where is C? C. Karl pressed the correct note. H. H. B. Felix knew he struggled more with the black keys. Karl froze. Um, he scanned the keyboard, then slowly thumbed a B. Felix smiled. Correct. You are doing quite splendidly today. Before they got to the harmonized scales, a knock at the door disrupted them. Cecil answered and came to the parlor, escorting Herr Schumann. Robert smiled immensely at seeing little Carl beside Felix. Felix was about to stand, but Robert begged, Oh, please stay seated. Let me hear you two at least a little. This is far too adorable not to watch. Papa, this one. Carl pointed to the F major scale. Felix placed his hands, and Carl began playing his scale exercise. The accompaniment was clever, but simple for Carl to follow. Robert couldn't help but smile. Once a few scales were played, Carl went away to find toys to play with instead. Music was tiring after a while. Felix stood and gestured Robert to sit on the sofa. Schumann sat and explained, I know you've been searching for new composers and works to perform. In my outings of critiquing, I've happened upon a young man that may be worth your while. He has interest in sending a symphony. His name is Richard Wagner. He also showed interest in the Future Academy. Ah, I would be glad to meet him. I happen to be free later tonight after I get the children to bed. I do warn it may be chaotic when you come. Felix chuckled as little Carl came back, giving his father a mischievous glance. He ran to Felix's lap, attacking him with hugs. Robert laughed, then said, this evening will work. Wagner is rather in a trance to meet you. He stood. Felix tried to get up, but Carl was wrestling. He hit Felix in the face roughly. Felix in an instant became stern. Carl, you do not hit. Now stop this and go to your room. Sorry, Papa. Carl went off in tears. Robert commented of the somber child. Poor little thing. He's cute on the outside. Don't let him deceive you, Felix warned. Robert chuckled, then made his leave. Later that evening, after dinner finished, the house was in turmoil as the children complained of not wanting to go to bed. Young Paul cried, Marie huffed, and Carl snapped at his father. I am not going to bed. You are going now, no buts, Felix pointed down the hall. In the midst of the chaos, there was a knock on the door. Felix went to answer and let Herr Schumann and Wagner in. Please excuse me for a moment, Felix apologized turning back to his children. Cecil carried wailing Paul to the bedroom. The two eldest took more convincing. Felix warned Marie, if you don't go to bed, you get no dessert tomorrow. Instantly, she ran to her bed. Carl crossed his arms. That doesn't fool me anymore. Carl, go to bed. Felix nudged him. Carl nudged back, but sprinted as he knew he wasn't to do such a thing. Felix chased and picked up the angsty child. He then took him to the bedroom. Cecil took care of the rest of the matter so Felix could tend to the guests. 
When he returned, Robert gave a warm smile. Herr Wagner rather appeared in disgust. Felix assumed it to be the young man's nature, so held out his hand. It's a pleasure to greet you here, Richard. A pleasure? He lightly shook Felix's hand in reluctance. It struck Felix odd that Wagner had such a strange demeanor towards him, discreetly wiping their handshake off on his coat. As an awkward silence came, Felix took note of a score in Richard's hands. What is it you have? It appears to be a symphony. Let's take it to my office. Robert and Richard followed Felix down the hallway. Once they got to the office, Felix sat at his desk. Robert pulled up a chair, and Richard took a seat at the small clavier. Felix then skimmed Richard's symphony. It seemed to have captivating qualities, but at the same time appeared a typical composition of romanticism. Felix nodded, keeping an enthused expression, hiding his opinion. To avoid any questions, he suggested, Why don't I get us coffee? He got up. Schumann mentioned, Excuse me a moment, but I must use the restroom before we get to business. I'll show you where it is. Felix went out the door with Robert, leaving Richard alone. In his moment by himself, Wagner stood and ventured to Felix's desk. An intriguing piece in progress sat. Richard read it letting it play in his head. The beginning had a fanfare of excitement. The trumpet sounded like gold pillars, leading the whole orchestra into a royal chord. It was like a bride and groom exiting the aisle in grace after reciting their vows of marriage. Though the music had a whimsical essence of purity, Richard had his own opinions of Felix. Musically speaking, there were points Wagner did not care for. He intended to give Felix a piece of his mind if he agreed to perform his symphony. Felix conducted at faster tempos, and Wagner wasn't going to have it for his music. Yet it wasn't only the music he felt in a trifle about. There was something else that he could not get past. It concerned Felix himself. To Herr Wagner, the only thing that came to his mind was Felix's heritage and family background. Oh, I see you intensely looking at my march I'm working on. Felix came back with a tray of coffee. He set it on a nearby end table. Richard jumped, excusing. I was only glancing. What do you think of it? It's a commission for King Frederick. It looks all right. Wagner reluctantly took a cup of coffee as Felix handed it to him. He quickly moved away as Felix went to sit at the desk. It boggled Felix as this young man seemed so skittish around him. He asked Richard, is something the matter? Nine, he set the coffee aside. Felix knew there was something as Herr Wagner began glaring, giving a rather threatening look. Turning to his desk, Felix felt a sense of tension in waiting for Robert. As he penned some music, Richard came, looking over his shoulder. Felix ignored him and continued writing. All was fine until a snotty remark came from Wagner's mouth. You're just writing for the king's money. Schumann came into the corridor, heading back to Felix's office. The sound of arguing made him rush. Cecil peeked from the children's room in wonder, but turned back, not wanting to wake the children. When entering the office, Robert found Richard and Felix snapping at each other. Felix hissed, Your music is exaggerated. You conduct Beethoven's music far too fast. Richard spewed his opinions. Your music also portrays nothing but childish themes of fairy tales, the notes prancing about like a weak, innocent fawn, like yourself. If I wrote a wedding piece, it would be the utmost standard work for a bride and groom to walk the aisle to. Felix threw down his pen, about to stand, but Robert scolded the both of them. Order, order. This is to be a gentlemanly meeting. Let us have coffee. He took a cup. Felix obeyed. Wagner still refused. Robert sighed, but enticed. Why don't you play a bit of the clavier, so Felix can hear you? Fine. Richard turned to the keys and began a work of his. Felix listened, knowing the man had talent, but the attitude soured his liking. He knew truly why Wagner hated him. There would be no convincing, deeming them enemies for life and thereafter. That same evening, I was headed to Felix's home with my violin at hand. We were going to discuss the violin concerto I requested. Felix wanted to try out some sections to see what needed editing. He had been working at the concerto off and on throughout the past few years. I hoped that it would have come together sooner, but the commissions of King Frederick hindered his time. When I came to the apartment, I knocked lightly. 
Schumann happened to answer. He and Herr Wagner were getting their coats to leave. I had not become acquainted with Wagner, so I set my violin case down, took my gloves off to give a shake of the hand. The stern face glared at me in utter disgust. He commented to Felix, Be sure to keep my symphony in mind. Richard then butted past me out the door. Schumann sighed to us. Sorry for this hassle. He followed Wagner. What was that all about? I felt quite confused. Felix assured, Don't feel bad. He's just that way towards people like you and I. Let's move on to something better. I'll get the concerto score. I followed Felix to his office. There he set his violin concerto score in progress at the conducting desk. I opened my violin case and tuned the fine instrument. Felix grabbed another score that was a mess on his desk and shoved it in the cabinet. He stated that Wagner left his symphony with me. I think I'll tell him I misplaced it or something. Anyways, let's look at the concerto. Felix gestured me to start at the beginning. I played the opening to the first interlude after the ascending octaves. The sound pleased Felix. He then went to business. So the phrase starting at measure 76, when the violin enters again, I wondered if that would be better, an octave higher. Right now I have it starting at H5, going up to G, and so on. It seems to me that it would sing more at a higher range, but you try it. All right, I held the violin to my chin and played the phrase up the octave, then in the written form. After switching back and forth, I stated, It is true that it sings in the higher voicing, but there is a warmth that erupts from the original version. I felt a good sense in the lower version, so we shall keep it that way. Now, I do have a cadenza in the first movement, but contrary to what you know, and you may not agree, but I don't want the cadenza improvised. I want it as written. Are you sure I enticed? Are you truly sure you don't want me to add my own touches in the moment? I do want your input. In fact, if you wish, write in what you think needs to be added. Though I do like your improvising, I don't want this done in the spur of a moment. Bitte, don't deceive me in the performance. He flipped to the written solo. I'll try not to. I looked at it and sight read through it. Some challenging sections caused me to review what he wrote. I added things so it made more sense from the perspective of a violinist. Felix seemed pleased, but the second time I ran it, I veered slightly into my own world. I think I can manage the written version. I'm happy as long as there are no notes held dreadfully long. I swear if you do, I shall add a trill. I spoke in all seriousness. Of course, I know you, Felix chuckled, then explained. The next thing I must mention is that each movement should be continued into the next. No pauses between. There is no break in the work? 9. I am tired of the audience clapping between every movement, so I shall train them not to, Felix stated. I shrugged a little at these ideas, but continued on. In the last movement of the work, Felix mentioned, I mean for the last movement to complement the skill of your right hand, so please have fun with it. I shall. I bowed a few phrases of it. After working on things here and there, Felix moved to discussing the future Academy of Leipzig. He informed, 34 pupils have already sent their names to be students. So far, the teachers are to be you, Robert and Clara Schumann, Herr Hauptmann, Herr Polenz, Herr Becker, and I. I'm in search of a singing master, as I do not want the teaching of singing to be done away with. I ever so want Ignaz Mochelis to be head of the school. Did I tell you that he has plans to move here? Nine, but that would be great. I would be more tedious in getting things together, but there is so much music I'm revising, and then there is the hundredth anniversary of the foundation of Leipzig subscription concerts. We are to have a supper for the orchestra, Felix gave a tired sigh. I assured, things will progress with time. A week or so later, Felix paced about the parlor, anxious as ever. It was nearing the midnight hour, and Cecil was yelling from the bedroom, having a child. A doctor was with her tending to the occasion. All Felix could do was wait. He felt nervous, as he did each time. Johann made sure the other children stayed in their room. After the passing of another hour, a baby's cries echoed. The doctor came to the parlor, informing, Congratulations, you have another son. He guided Felix to where Cecil laid in bed, holding the baby, freshly wrapped in a blanket. 
Felix sat at the bedside to get a closer look at the child. Cecil stated, This one should be Felix Jr. He looks like a Felix to me. I like that name, Felix kissed her. Besides gaining a new member of the family, other things were being accomplished. In concern of the St. Thomas School, Felix raised money by giving organ concerts. His hard work paid off as the Bach Monument was placed near the school. Felix couldn't help but feel proud as the elegant statue sparkled in the sunlight. It was obvious who his favorite composer was. Felix was also on the lookout for old pieces to revive. He hoped to find a copy of Mozart's Die Zabelflot in the original German. By mid-February, the Academy of Leipzig progressed enough to commence. The classes came together through experience and trial, teaching ten sankers. The rest wanting instruction were to pay seventy-five dollars a year. Felix spent much of his time at the Academy to teach classes. He planned to do so for a short while, at least until the school increased and generalized. The school made a fair start with new pupils joining daily, causing lessons to increase, in turn making the need for more staff. There was no trouble in finding teachers, as there was plenty of musicians from the orchestra. Five directors had been chosen, who were inclined in the system of organizing a conservatorium, but none of them were musical, hence the reason Felix wanted Ignaz to be head of the academy. The project did not go by without any troubles. Two ladies were afflicting things. The directors wanted to enlarge and expand even more by building houses in higher rooms. Felix felt they were wishing to jump ahead. He believed the two large rooms, giving simultaneous lectures, were sufficient. The other milady had to do with the students. All of the pupils wanted to compose and theorize, while Felix believed the principal thing that ought to be taught is sound practical work. Sound playing, keeping in time, sound knowledge of sound music, to teach them what is good music, first so, then they can make well-rounded music. Out of that, all other knowledge would grow of itself. Felix wished art to be far from a mere handicraft. As Herr Schumann gave a lecture on music interpretation in one room, Felix held a theory class in the other. He was working with a group of students who were young in the ways of music. They had finished a lesson in intervals. While the class worked on homework, a group of students giggled together. What's so funny? Felix asked in a curious tone, as he glanced up from his desk in the midst of work. One student murmured, Major Fifth. Okay, don't be swearing now, Felix scolded. Another student asked, What was that one song by Chopin you played the other day? Peace, Felix corrected. Music without words is a piece. Explain your songs without words. Another student looked up from their paperwork. Felix face palmed. He concentrated on a letter he was penning to Ignaz, calculating a dry estimate of income and cost of living to move to Leipzig. Felix concluded that the total pay request for students would be $200 per annum, an amount decently equal to the cost of living. Yet Englishmen, who lived rather better, required $250 to $300. Felix did some maths and the equivalents. In English money, it was around 50 to 60 pounds. There was much satisfaction in his workday at the academy, writing to Ignaz while the students worked obediently in the background. Yet such moments couldn't last a mere minute. Felix grabbed a letter, stashed in his folder. It was from Berlin. He didn't feel like thinking about that city, but he couldn't ignore the royal letter forever. The first glance at it agitated him. Herr Masso had poured the king's bags into words for Felix to return to Berlin. There was to be a conference held, giving Felix a new title of high standing. The inquiry embarrassed him, as he didn't want to be like some composers, who had more decorations than good compositions. King Frederick overestimated him, as he began spewing commissions on top of the ones in progress. The long chorale of Felix's Herrgott de Schlobenwehr was to be arranged for chorus and orchestra. In the coming weeks, Felix worked his tail off to complete it. It became the most tiring thing he had ever attempted. Things were still not organized in Berlin academy-wise. He wrote to his brother Paul, wanting to write directly to the king, breaking off every affair with Berlin, but did not feel justified to do so. Though he wanted to be in Leipzig by inclination, he felt drawn to Berlin by the promises he made to the king. 
In the entire affair, Felix felt so angry and bewildered by the king's demands. Herr Tick, another correspondent of the king, frequently wrote, as he was in charge of making sure Felix was fulfilling the commissions. The pressure made Felix feel physically ill over matters. To top it off, the king decided to come to Leipzig for a concert at the year's end. Felix knew he would have to adhere to the king face to face. With that to come, he and his family would have no choice but to lose their home in Leipzig. Felix didn't agree with it, nor thought it fair, but concluded that he would have to make the heart-aching decision of choosing someone to take over as director of the Gavant House.